You are watching A Moment in Crime, the vignette series produced by the True Crime Man's Dark Imagination YouTube channel. On this channel, we have profiled those who believe in the almighty dollar as a motive for their crimes. This profile demonstrates the epitome of a bluebeard, a killer with no remorse and no realization of right or wrong, just the endless scheming to make sure he would not have to make an honest living to survive. Yet, he takes life for his own selfish benefit. Alice Burnham was a 24-year-old attractive young woman who had everything to live for. On December 18, 1913, the landlady living in her building heard Burnham's new husband screaming out for help. When the landlady ran to the couple's flat, she found the woman's husband, George Joseph Smith, bending over the tub, holding the head of a dead nude woman. Alice was ruled dead from an accidental drowning. The drowning, incidentally, had been the second incident that happened to Smith within a year. Smith's modus operandi appeared to be his love for money was more powerful than his love for women. Smith was born at Bethnal Green in 1872. As a young man, Smith expressed an interest in greed more than expressing any human emotions. At the age of nine, Smith spent some time in a boys' reformatory and then served time for stealing at the age of 17. Smith allegedly fell in love with a young woman in his youth named Edith Pegler. Smith was lazy and felt he deserved to make money because of his way with the ladies rather than any other marketable skill. The father of one of the women that Smith attempted to court described Smith's eyes as those looking like a mad dog. One of the many women he would later marry stated, the power lay in his eyes. It has been said that Smith may have been a product of Victorian England where men who were adventurous and risked everything became wealthy, whereas young women, who were the daughters of these wealthy men, may have been well off, so to speak, but they looked for husbands, and wealthy husbands at that. Smith took advantage of this desire. Smith first married a young 18-year-old woman named Caroline Thornhill. Thornhill believed she married a successful businessman named George Love, who owned a bread shop. Smith, Love, soon went bankrupt and forced Caroline to work as a maidservant in order to help support the married couple. But then Smith coerced his wife into stealing jewelry and valuables from her employers. At first, the married couple lived in London and then moved to Brighton and Eastburn to rob Caroline's rich employers. Caroline proved successful at this venture until one day, at a pawn shop, she tried to sell some jewelry from one of the families she worked for at the time. The pawnbroker became suspicious and called the police. Caroline was arrested and then spent a year in prison for trying to sell stolen property. As a result of this arrest, Smith, or Love, disappeared during her incarceration. But one day, Caroline, by chance, spotted Smith on the street. She then called the police and they arrested her estranged husband. Because of his coercion in causing Caroline to steal, police charged him with conspiracy and then put him on trial. After being found guilty, the court sentenced Smith to two years in prison. Caroline relished in her revenge, but it did not deter Smith from pursuing further criminal activities after his release from prison. Smith may have desired to exact some form of revenge against Caroline, but he never got the chance due to Caroline's move to Canada. However, the two never did divorce. In August 1910, Smith walked along the street in Clifton, Bristol, 
when he met Beatrice Bessie Monday, using the moniker Henry Williams, and later married Bessie, a woman in her late 30s. Smith discovered that Bessie stood to inherit 2,500 pounds upon the death of her father. The father died of natural causes, and because the money had been placed in keeping of trustees, Smith could not get his hands on the funds. He did, however, persuade her to give him 150 pounds, and he abandoned her. Smith convinced his wife to come and visit him at Weston Sumer. When she arrived, Smith convinced her that he had contracted a venereal disease and did not want to expose her. Overjoyed to have her husband return to her, Bessie took Smith back to her residence. Then, a few days later, Smith convinced Bessie that the two had to draw up wills, whereby, if Bessie passed away, Smith would inherit the 2,500 pounds. Ironically, if Smith died, Bessie received nothing. Two days after finalizing the wills, Smith coerced Bessie to negotiate a two-shilling discount in Hearn Bay, the location of their residence at the time. Smith described to a local doctor that his wife may be experiencing epileptic fits. Bessie reluctantly agreed to see the local doctor and described her symptoms that Smith earlier described to him. On the following morning, Smith sent the doctor a note that simply stated, Come at once, my wife is dead. When the doctor arrived, he found Bessie on her back in the tub, her face still submerged. Smith claimed he did not hear her struggling, and when he went into the bathroom to check on her, he found her in the way the doctor had discovered her. The doctor did not discover anything unusual about Bessie's death when he arrived at the scene. An inquest jury determined that Bessie died as a result of drowning after suffering an epileptic fit. Smith now was a very rich man for the time, and returned the bathtub that he had purchased after Bessie argued for the discount for a full refund. For her funeral, Smith chose the cheapest casket available and refused to pay for a private plot so that his dead wife would be buried in a pauper's grave. One thing mentioned at the coroner's inquest that Smith never considered was that Bessie had clasped a bar of soap in her right hand. This would become important at a later time. Smith met Alice Burnham, his second wife, in South Sea in September 1913. On the day of their wedding, November 4th, Smith brought his wife to a doctor to certify her healthy so that he may purchase a life insurance policy in the amount of 500 pounds, with Smith as the beneficiary. In December, Smith approached Alice to honeymoon in Blackpool. Smith, it has been surmised, wanted to get away as fast as he could from the first murder. When the two arrived, Smith tried to find a rooming house that had an indoor bathroom. The two finally settled on the lodging house of one Margaret Crossley, who took Alice to a local doctor after she complained of persistent headaches. On the evening of December 12, 1913, three days after Smith and Alice arrived in Blackpool, Mrs. Crossley noticed some drops of water coming through her kitchen ceiling while she knew that Alice took a bath upstairs. Just as Crossley noticed the water, Smith showed up at her kitchen, perhaps to provide himself with an alibi. Subsequently, Smith went back upstairs and then returned to Mrs. Crossley's flat and stated that he discovered his wife dead in the bath. Smith covered his tracks very well because once the authorities arrived at the scene, they discovered nothing suspicious. Smith's marriage to Alice Burnham lasted barely a month before her death. Smith met his next victim, Margaret Lofty, with the moniker of John Lloyd, a land agent. He met Margaret in Bath, England, the following November, and they married on December 18, 1914. And shortly after their marriage, Smith insured her for 700 pounds. The couple started their honeymoon in Highgate, North London, and Smith, true to his modus operandi, took his wife to a doctor on their wedding night. Margaret like Alice, complained of suffering from severe headaches. On the following evening, the landlady at their lodgings, Louise Blatch, stood in her kitchen ironing a piece of clothing when she heard the sound of splashing coming from the bathroom above. Blatch thought she heard what she believed were the sounds of wet hands rubbing along the side of the bath and then a deep sigh. Blatch also believed that she heard some strains of the hymn, Nearer My God to Thee, 
being played on a harmonium in the Lloyd sitting room. Blatch then heard the front door slammed with Smith knocking at her door. He stated that he left the flat to go out and get some tomatoes for his wife's dinner, but realized he forgot his key. Margaret's death was recorded as a misadventure, with Smith receiving 3,700 pounds, which would be equivalent to 190,000 pounds in today's money. The day after Margaret's death, Alice Burnham's father spotted the story in the local newspaper and noted similarities to Margaret's death and that of his daughter. Alice's father contacted the Kent police and authorities arrested Smith in February 1915 when he visited his solicitor to discuss Margaret's will. When police suggested that the death of Bessie Mundy might also have been linked to the deaths of Alice Burnham and Margaret Lofty, the bodies of the former wives were then exhumed. Medical examiners believed that no foul play existed in those deaths. However, the famous pathologist Bernard Spilsbury, the coroner during the Holly Harvey Crippen murder case, felt it strange that Bessie Mundy clung to a bar of soap when she died. If she really had suffered a faint or a fit, as her inquest suggested, the hand would have been relaxed and let the soap go. This suggested that the women had died suddenly and had no time to put up a fight. With these suspicions, the authorities charged Smith with the murders. The trial began on June 22, 1915. When the trial took place, the defense attempted to plead insanity on behalf of their client. The prosecution, under English law, could only try Smith for the murder of Bessie Mundy, but used the other two deaths to establish a pattern for his crimes. The forensic examiners proved that Smith grabbed the ankles of his wives and pulled them under the water, producing quick unconsciousness. And there was no way that these women could have died by accident given the size of the tub, depth of the water, and the positions of the bodies. In their closing statement, the prosecution stated, With all the cunning of a great criminal, this man invented the epilepsy theory to explain away the death of each of his wives. He surveyed carefully the surroundings of each of his murder scenes and rehearsed it in his mind the most insignificant details to make certain he could not be trapped. After the trial, the jury deliberated for only 22 minutes before they found the defendant guilty. Carolyn Thornhill, Smith's legal wife, returned to England for the trial and married a Canadian soldier after Smith's execution. The execution took place on August 13, 1915, ending the reign of the Brides in the Bath murderer. George Joseph Smith came from a long line of those murderers who believe they cannot be apprehended. Smith used the same method over and over again, and it appeared he made no secret of his intentions by continually meeting women and getting married. A bigamist, at best, it speaks to society as a whole that allows men such as Smith to reach predator status and prey on the defenseless. We have never exhibited opinions on capital punishment on this program, but we believe after Smith's crimes have been assessed, no one deserved a more fitting punishment. If you enjoyed this presentation, please hit like, subscribe, and hit the bell so that you will be alerted as to future upcoming episodes. Also, if you would like to support our channel, we are on Subscribestar.com, Rumble.com, Facebook, Twitter, and we have a PayPal account so that we may continue to bring you this programming. I will leave the links below in the comments.